Now we turn again this evening to the passage which we've been studying in recent Sunday evenings in Colossians chapter 3. And this evening we are going to read once again in Colossians 3 verses 1 to 11. Colossians chapter 3, reading verses 1 to 11. In this letter, Paul is seeking to correct some wrong and mistaken views which the Colossians have begun to hear about how to live the Christian life. And he has been dealing with those false views in the closing verses of chapter 2. He is turning now to the true character of the Christian life and giving instruction to the Colossian Christians of a practical nature about how to live for Christ's honor and glory. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self or the old man with its practices and have put on the new self or the new man who is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all, and Christ is in you all. We have been looking at this great third chapter of Colossians, as you would see from the order of service, under this general heading of nine essential keys to the Christian life. And we come this evening to key number six, which we have entitled Dealing with with sin. And we have noted over the past couple of Sundays how the Apostle Paul is deeply concerned to answer this question. How am I as a Christian going to be able to live in such a way that I develop the mastery of self on the one hand and develop an ability, a growing ability to overcome sin and to overcome temptation on the other hand? And we have noticed that in the context of this teaching, the Apostle Paul is stressing a number of important things. The first thing we noticed, and we emphasized how primary this is, if we are really going to be successful in growing in Christ-likeness and being able to overcome the ongoing and sometimes prevailing lusts and passions of our heart. It is, first of all, absolutely vital that we take the reality of ongoing sin in our lives as Christians with great seriousness, that we do not pretend that we have already reached perfection. The Apostle John was troubled by that in the congregations to which he wrote, Christians who believed that they had passed beyond the possibility of sinning. And he says, if anyone says that there is no sin in him, then that person is a liar. But while we do not say that to one another, we do not say, I am free from sin. We do sometimes pretend to ourselves that ongoing indwelling sin is neither as serious nor as strong as it actually is. And the Apostle Paul, in the way he goes about teaching these Colossians, 
in the almost embarrassing way in which he brings out, as it were, into the public arena and names the sins that continue to haunt and plague Christians, is really saying to them, Christians in Colossae, Christians everywhere, point number one, if you're going to be able to overcome sin, you need to recognize that its presence is still in your heart and that it has a variety of manifestations. And so he gives us in these verses these almost unbearable lists of the way in which a Christian's heart may still be perverted. And he says that's where you've got to start. If you're going to go through with this matter of growing in holiness to the end, you have got to start by recognizing the ongoing presence of sin. I think I quoted Robert Murray McChain in this regard the other weekend when he wrote in his diary as a young man, I have now come to the realization that the seeds of every known sin still dwell in my heart as a Christian believer. Recognizing that, I cannot overemphasize this, recognizing that, goes a long way to genuine Christian progress. If you haven't come to recognize that, you've scarcely come to recognize yourself, to know yourself sufficiently, to know how to progress. And this is the reason why Paul emphasizes it so much. But the second thing he emphasizes is, not only must I look inwards to discover the ongoing fickleness and sinfulness of my own heart, He says, I must look outwards to Jesus Christ and recognize that in Jesus Christ, I have become part of a new creation. The old has gone into the past. The new has come. I am no longer the man or the woman I once was. I am no longer dominated by the powers by which I once was dominated. They may not be absent yet from my life, but they no longer have authority and reign and rule over my life. Jesus Christ alone has authority and reign and rule over my life. And that makes all the difference in the world. But when he has said this, we are still left or ought to be left still asking the Apostle Paul this important question. But Paul, tell me how I go about dealing with sin, putting sin to death, as he puts it, how do I go about that in a very practical way? And I want to try and answer that question this evening by drawing out from this passage and doubtless from other places as well in Scripture five basic principles, five basic principles that need to be hammered into my mind and hammered into my life as a nail to which I may go on to attach the whole of my Christian life in order that I may grow in grace and holiness and Christ-likeness. I have said before, and I want to say again, it is my personal conviction that dealing with our own sin is one of the areas in most of our lives as Christians where we tend to fail to the point of embarrassment. If a fellow Christian came to you and said, I am struggling with this particular sin, it is a very challenging thought to ask yourself the question, have I myself so struggled with sin and overcome it that I could say with confidence to that fellow Christian, let me tell you how by God's grace and through the instruction the Scripture gives to us, let me tell you how God makes provision for us, gives direction to us, to enable us to overcome the ongoing presence of sin in our lives. Well, here are the five principles. Principle number one, which is enshrined in Paul's words in verse 5, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Principle number one is this that you and I must ever learn to deprive indwelling sin of its opportunity. That seems, doesn't it, so basic. It scarcely needs to be emphasized, but we recognize that it does. 
It is the first principle. If you do not want to be burnt, then you stay well away from the fire. And that is one of the things that the Apostle Paul implies here when he says you've got to put sin to death. You starve it of its oxygen supply. You asphyxiate it. You do not bring it into a context where a conflagration will result and the presence of indwelling sin in your life will have every opportunity to exercise itself and to spread. It is the point that Paul makes in very simple and stark terms when he writes to his young friend Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.22. Timothy, he says, a man now in his thirties. Timothy, he says, flee your lusts. That's what you do with them. Whenever you discover arising in your heart some motivation, some desire, some passion, some habit, that is contrary to the will of God, contrary to the character of Jesus Christ, what do you do with it? Oh, says the apostle, you turn from it. You flee from it. In these words, you put it to death. You rid yourself of it. You take it off. I've often wondered whether when Paul says to Timothy, flee youthful lusts, whether he had in the back of his mind the picture of the youthful Joseph described in Genesis 39. You remember when he was almost a captive in Potiphar's house and Potiphar's wife made effort after effort after effort after effort to seduce him. And as that came to a climax, what did Joseph do? He fled. He simply fled and would not allow himself to remain in the same room as Potiphar's wife whatever the consequences might be for him. You and I, by God's grace, will not find ourselves in such dramatic situations. But whether it be hidden, whether it be small, whether it be great, whether it be public, have you fixed this principle in your mind, Christian? Wherever I find myself drawn to sin, wherever I discover desire, passion, thought coming into my mind that would draw me away from my Lord Jesus Christ, I know there is one thing I need to do. I need to mentally or even physically turn away from it and to make sure that I have deprived sin of the oxygen which will give it breath and life and deny it every opportunity to grow and develop in my life. And so you and I need to live with that principle. Most of us who have been Christians any length of time were taught that principle at the very beginning of our Christian lives. Turn from every opportunity to sin, whether it be external and physical or whether it be internal and mental. You must learn to deprive sin of opportunity to grow. Principle number two is this. You must learn to oppose sin generally or universally. Deprive sin on every occasion of opportunity. Principle number two, learn to oppose sin generally or universally. What do I mean by that? I think this is part of the function of this list of sins that the apostle gives here at the middle of Colossians chapter 3. Why does he go into such detail? And why is it that as you look down through that list, you might take one off and cross the other off and say, not likely for me, I might fall into that. Not likely for me, I might fall into that. It is for this very important reason. The apostle Paul recognizes that diverting the force and passion of indwelling sin is not the same thing as dealing a mortal blow to it. And it's altogether possible for us to find sin and sinful tendencies arising in our hearts, in our minds, in our lifestyle and character that causes a certain embarrassment. Or certainly if they were known to our fellow Christians would cause us a great deal of personal embarrassment. 
And so what we do is we tone down their visible manifestation, but at the same time we allow ourselves to indulge our lusts, to indulge the flesh, to indulge our sinful thoughts in some other and more private direction. But that is not putting sin to death. That is simply diverting sin to some other possible outlet. That's what I sometimes think of whimsically as the old-fashioned toothpaste view of dealing with sin. They don't make toothpaste tubes the way they used to, but those of you who remember the old toothpaste tubes, they were always getting cracks in them as you rolled them up and you stuck your finger over one of the cracks and squeezed it out of the top of the tube, but then you discover that cracks were developing all over the place. And the Apostle Paul recognizes that sin is like that. Sin is he understands, is a force, a power, a a twistedness that's written into the very warp and woof of our character. And it's never sufficient for me simply to put my finger over the hole where it happens to be coming out in order that I may be less embarrassed, in order that I may appear to have grown more spiritually than I really have. If you are really dealing with any particular manifestation of sin in a way that will be fruitful and successful, you've got to deal with it not simply as an embarrassing manifestation of something in your heart, but as a symptom of something in your heart that remains contrary to the love and the mercy, the holiness and the grace of Almighty God and refuse it for that reason. Not because it embarrasses, because the day will come or the opportunity will come when it will embarrass you no longer, but because you recognize it for what it is. There is a very striking example of this in the book of Job. Job was going through a period of great suffering and he was struggling He was struggling to hold himself together. He was being incited, you remember, by his wife, curse God and die. In different ways, there were pressures upon him to sin. His body was racked with pain. And then all of a sudden, in the 31st chapter of the book of Job, he says something that seems to bear no reference whatsoever to anything else in his life. He is a married man, He has all these children. He has suffered great loss. He has been tempted in different ways. And then all of a sudden he says, I have made a covenant with my eyes that I will not look lustfully on a woman. If you had seen Job, you would have thought to yourself, the last man in the world in any condition to be lusting after a woman is this poor man stripped of his riches, stripped of his health, stripped of almost everything except his faith. And then suddenly out of the blue, as I say, he says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. I will not look lustfully at a woman. What's he doing? He's doing the Robert Murray McChain thing. He's recognizing that the potential for every conceivable sin is still in his heart. And while he may be able to deal with it in one way or another, he recognizes that its force, its pressure, its power may come upon him in a different way. And what he's essentially saying is this. Wherever there is the possibility of my falling into sin, I consciously commit myself to the Lord to turn away and to put that sin to death. You will never be successful in opposing one manifestation of sin in your Christian life unless you're prepared to go for the throat and strangle sin itself. That's what he's saying. So principle number one, deprive sin of its opportunity. Principle number two, oppose sin universally. Principle number three, be willing where necessary to develop mutual accountability. Be willing where necessary to develop mutual accountability. Now, where is that in this passage? What is mutual accountability? 
Mutual accountability is my going to someone else and saying, I am struggling with this in my life. I am struggling with this in my life. Will you stand beside me? Will you pray for me? Will you counsel me? And will you keep an eye upon me? May I come to you and share with you how I am struggling, how I am doing. Will you stand beside me? Now, where is that in this passage? Well, it's here in this passage and amazingly in so many other passages in the Bible in this simple principle that almost every single one of the you's, the second persons that you find in Paul's letters are plural you's, not singular you's. But most of us read Paul's letters as though he were speaking simply to us as isolated individuals. But what if we translate Paul's words as they may well be translated? Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature as a fellowship of God's people. So that you lift up your eyes and look out for one another. Paul isn't saying, now listen to the sermon, you Christians in Colossae, and go home and work it out on your own. He's saying, no, you Colossian Christians, you're a fellowship, you're a family. I'm calling you in God's name to find ways of working this out together. And it is my conviction, and certainly as I read the way in which Christians have written on this subject over the centuries, it's obviously been a long-standing conviction of great and much wiser Christians than I am, that there are some sinful characteristics that take hold of the lives of some Christians that they may never be released from until they enter into a relationship of mutual accountability with another believer. There are many reasons for that. I don't want to take the time to explain it to you tonight, maybe some other Sunday. But tonight I want you to get this principle that there are occasions when the only way in which you are going to be able to break free from some sinful pattern of life that's taken a grip upon you is when you listen to the words of James in James chapter 5, confess your faults to each other and pray for each other. And sometimes simply in that action of sharing the truth about your heart with a fellow believer, and please make sure it's a fellow believer you can trust and one who will be totally confidential. We are not talking here about washing dirty linen in public. We are talking about that exhortation of James chapter 5, that there are times when we need to confess our faults to one another in order that we may seriously care for and pray for one another. And very often it is in that simple act of sharing the burden that has so gripped you that it has actually paralyzed you as a Christian. My friend, it's almost impossible in a gathering this size of Christian believers that there are not some of us this evening who are actually paralyzed by some sinful characteristic, some habit that we cannot break. And there are reasons why we are paralyzed. And very often it is in the sharing of that burden, the sharing of that need with a fellow believer that we begin to be released. I have several quite close friends in the United States. They all happen to be ministers of churches, but perhaps that's incidental. They could be businessmen as much as ministers of churches. And they often find themselves on the road, speaking at conferences, spending lonely nights in hotel rooms with television sets. And these Friends are so bound together that whenever they know that one or other is on the road speaking at a conference, on the road traveling, spending a night in a hotel room, they are pledged to phone each other and to ask each other the question, what are you watching on television tonight? You might think that's very trivial. My friends, if you saw the statistics of how Christians live in the early 21st century, you wouldn't think that was trivial at all. And you might even say, you might even be tempted to say, well, I would never need that kind of thing. 
If you think that, my dear friend, you haven't really begun to get to square one of the battle that we are in to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Mutual accountability can be one of the great helps to overcoming sin. Do you have a friend? Perhaps that's the question, and maybe it's a rather sad question, really. Do you have a friend to whom you could go and say, John, I'm struggling, and here's what I'm struggling about. Will you help me? Will you pray with me? I trust you to stand with me in this in order that I may be given grace to battle through. Principle number three, be willing when necessary to develop mutual accountability. Principle number four is this. Make sure that as you do this, you are also consciously developing the graces that are contrary to the sins with which you're dealing. Make sure that you are consciously developing the graces that are contrary to the sins with which you are dealing. Now here's the point, and again, it's of vital importance. You will never grow in grace and holiness and Christ-likeness simply by trying to put sin to death. Putting sin to death is negative. And as we've seen Paul emphasizes in this passage, the negative is vitally important. You can't say yes to something without saying no to something else. You can't say yes to Christ without saying no to sin. But you can't grow in Christ-likeness and holiness simply by focusing your attention on the struggle with sin. Because those sinful characteristics, those sinful tendencies need to be replaced, mastered, overcome by Christ-like characteristics. And that is why, as we've noticed before, there is this wonderful balance in this passage. Chapter 3, verse 5, put to death these things. Chapter 3, verse 12, as God's chosen people, put on these things, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, why is that so important? Ah, because it's these things that are the atmosphere that stifle sin. And it's very interesting, wherever you look in Paul's letters, where he deals with this kind of thing, wherever he says, you've got to say no to this, or you've got to put off this, or you've got to put this to death, without fail, he always stresses what you've got to put on, what you've to grow in. You remember the famous words through which Augustine was converted. In Romans 13, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. But that on its own is going to get you nowhere. That on its own actually will probably turn you into a frightful Pharisee. No, he says, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Live your life in Him, through Him, on Him, because of Him, in fellowship with Him. Love Him. See His graces develop in your life. Look into His face. Be transformed into His likeness. It is the same thing wherever you look in the Apostle Paul's teaching, in Romans, in Ephesians, in Titus, here in Colossians. It's everywhere. Remember the story Jesus told about the man who swept his house clean of the demons? But because he didn't put furniture in his house, the demons came back. And that's a picture of how it is in the Christian life. As we struggle against the various expressions of indwelling sin in our hearts, we simultaneously need to be looking away from our sinfulness to our Lord Jesus Christ and be consciously putting on his characteristics just as deliberately as we put off the sinful characteristics that Paul lists in verse 5 and 6. So we consciously put on the gracious characteristics. We deliberately pray, Lord Jesus, make me compassionate. Lord Jesus, make me patient. Lord Jesus, help me to become more like you. And as we do this more and more by God's grace, Our lives are transformed, and the glorious thing in this context is that sin finds it increasingly difficult to breathe where Christ is. 
I'm fascinated by that story that we find at the beginning of the gospel when Jesus went to preach in the synagogue and something dramatic happened. It had apparently never happened before. That's why it was so dramatic. But it happened, interestingly, wherever Jesus appeared. There was a man who was demon-possessed. And apparently he'd been able to sit in the synagogue services quietly for weeks, months, perhaps years. But as soon as Jesus appeared, all hell was let loose in the synagogue. These Colossians were discovering it's the same in the Christian life. Before you were a Christian, sin, since it is your master, has so mastered you, it seems to be invisible. Christ comes into your heart, and sin, all hell, can be let loose. What are you to do? You are not only to oppose the presence of indwelling sin in your heart, but more and more you are to give Jesus Christ room so that sin becomes, as it were, unable to breathe. So principle number one, deprive sin of its opportunity. Principle number two, oppose sin generally or universally. Principle number three, where necessary, enter into a fellowship of mutual accountability. Principle number four, develop the graces that are contrary. And principle number five, which is also principle number six and number seven and number eight and number nine and number ten, it's this. Be willing for the sake of Jesus Christ to do what is costly. The language that Paul uses here is the language that is used elsewhere in the New Testament to describe the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was put to death for our sins, says the Apostle Peter. Says the Apostle Paul, since he was put to death for your sins... You put sin to death in your heart for his glory. And that's the language that's used everywhere. There is no hint whatsoever in the pages of the New Testament that this is an easy, pain-free business. You cannot grow in Christian holiness. You cannot grow in overcoming ongoing sinfulness without coming to the cross, without feeling the pain of the cross placed upon your sin in order that it may be destroyed. But that's not the higher Christian life, is it? That's the beginning of the Christian life. Jesus said, take up the cross and follow me and be my disciple. Radical? Yes. Painful? Yes. But gloriously fruitful and liberating? Yes. I wonder how it is with us this evening, dear friends. How is it with our sin? How is it with our commitment to Jesus Christ? How is it with our desire to grow in holiness and to take by God's grace the inevitable pain of bearing the cross in order that we may show the fruit and eventually, in his mercy, wear the crown? In a sense, it always boils down simply to this. Do I love Jesus or do I love me? Day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, do I love him or do I love me? You know that he is infinitely more worthy of your love than you are of his love. So why not mark your life day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment with this commitment because I love Jesus, sin will be put to death. May God give us much grace.
so to live. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray as we hear your word this evening and as we begin to prepare to come and take these signs that remind us of how much Jesus did in order to deliver us from sin, we pray that you would give us grace to consecrate ourselves so unreservedly to him that there will be no doubt, that there will be no argument in our minds whenever we are tempted, whenever we discover the twistedness of our hearts, whenever we experience afresh the power of old lusts, there will be no doubt that we will put them to death and put Christ on the throne. Enable us, we pray, Lord, for we are weak, that we may do this. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen.